my screen. And can you see my screen now? Yes. Great. So um, this is the title, heteroscedastic, heteroscedastic proxy vector autoregressions. And then a second part, an identification robust test for time varying impulse responses in the presence of multiple proxies. This is joint work with uh, Martin Bruns, who is also present via uh, online, of course. Um, first of all, thanks very much for this invitation. I attended this seminar uh, last year already quite a few times and was very impressed by the series of talks I heard and um, found it a quite valuable um, thing to have. And um, now, my talk is uh, has kind of two uh, parts in the title, and I would like to start with the first part, heteroscedastic proxy vector autoregressions. And the idea is that if you have heteroscedasticity in proxy vector autoregressions, there may be a problem that is not usually taken so seriously apparently. And I would like to point it out first before I come to the second part of my title. The whole thing is pretty long, almost like an abstract already. But let me start with talking a little bit about heteroscedastic proxy vector autoregressions and what might be a problem there. Before I do that, uh, what's going on now? Okay, um, here is the outline, but uh, you know, I come back to that when I come to the individual points. Um, let me give you an example of a possible proxy vector autoregressive uh, analysis. And in this case, it's uh, from a, a kind of based on a paper by Lunsford from 2015, and he was interested in productivity shocks in the United States. So he set up a little system with five variables, GDP growth, employment growth, inflation, consumption growth, investment growth, and he identified productivity shocks. I'm, I'm putting up just one here. I come back to uh, what he really did, but let's suppose we are just uh, interested in one shock now and uh, total factor productivity shock. So that's uh, the kind of shock we have to find. And, proxy for, and if you have a proxy, then we can proceed with the analysis. I will uh, talk about that in a minute, but before that, let me just show you the residuals of the model that uh, we estimated when we use uh, the data from Lunsford. Uh, we get the following residuals, and I have already as this red bar in the middle, roughly in the middle of my panels, because as you can see on the right hand side of the bar, the volatility of, the, of many of these residuals is quite different from the volatility on the left hand side. So there's clearly something like heteroscedasticity going on. And that is quite common in these uh, systems. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions or comments when I go along, please just interrupt me, switch on your microphone and uh, interrupt me, don't write it in the uh, chat because I'm not so good in following these things. Although I have my co-author with me, he, he can help me a little bit with that, I guess. Anyway, um, when I talk and I, I'm focused on, on what I'm saying and not on the things on the frame, uh, outside the frame of my, my uh, slides. So we have heteroscedasticity here. So what do people do in proxy vector autoregressive analysis when they have a situation like this, and that is not so uncommon in macro studies and generally in uh, structural vector autoregressive analysis, where well, they use heteroscedasticity robust methods. Well, that's quite, you know, the, the thing to do when you have heteroscedasticity and are not interested very much in this heteroscedasticity. But there could be a problem when you have heteroscedasticity in especially in proxy VARs. And to explain that a little better, let me just start with explaining what we do when we do a 
proxy vector autoregressive uh, analysis more formally. So let me write up a few formulas to understand what the problem, where the problem could come in. Uh, we have k variables in our example. It was five variables, and we have uh, an autoregressive vector autoregressive model that is a, regarded as a, a generating a process uh, with leg order p, and the residuals are denoted here by ut. So this is the reduced form of the VAR process. So these are the reduced form residuals, the uts, and they are of course white noise, mean zero, and now I'm, let's start with a homoscedastic case. Let's pretend we have a homoscedastic model. Then of course the covariance would be time invariant. It's denoted by sigma u here. Now the structural form for uh, suitable for proxy vector autoregressive analysis uh, looks like this. The first part is like in the reduced form, only the error term is changed here. Namely is now, a matrix B times the structural shocks. This B matrix is the matrix of impact effects. You see when one of the shocks in this W vector hits the system, it tells us what happens with the YT variables. Of course, we have K structural shocks here also in this WT vector, and they are related to the reduced form vectors through this B matrix. B inverse times UT gives you the structural shocks. So B is a matrix of impact effects, as I mentioned already. And we are assuming that structural shocks are instantaneously uncorrelated. So they have a diagonal covariance matrix. And then we have this uh, relation between the structural parameters and the reduced form parameters. And there is only this uh, covariance matrix uh, of the re uh, reduced form residuals that is relevant here to dig out the structural parameters. And as you know, you know, there is, uh, we need more information to do that in a unique way. Now, let's suppose we are interested only primarily in one shock and uh, this productivity shock, say. And let's put that at the very beginning of our vector of structural shocks. So W1T would be the TFB shock. And um, for that shock, we have also constructed maybe a proxy variable, which is hopefully closely related to that shock and has a lot of information on the first shock. And it has uh, satisfies these two conditions that usually uh, we want from these structure, uh, from these uh, proxies, namely it's uh, highly correlated with the first shock and hopefully not correlated with the other shocks, any of the other shocks. The first condition is called the relevance condition, the second, the exogeneity condition uh, normally. And now if we plug in you know, this relation between the reduced form errors and the structured errors, and, and look at the covariance between the reduced form errors and the proxy, we see that we get exactly the first column of our B matrix, or not exactly, uh, constant times the first column of the B matrix. And that is exactly what we need. We need the first column of the B matrix because that's the impact effects of the shock of interest. And those determine also all the uh, shocks, the, the propagation of the shocks through the system at higher propagation horizons. And uh, of course we need for that also the other reduced form parameters like the um, slope coefficients of our VAR process and so forth. But if we have the first column of our matrix of impact effects, the impact effects of the first shock, then we are there. That's all we need, right? So that seems quite easy here to get because what we can do is we estimate our model by say P squares, ordinarily squares each equation separately. We get our uh, estimated residuals and then we determine the covariance between the reduced form errors and the proxy by the usual formula, right? We compute the uh, usual estimator for the covariance and uh, that is a multiple then, uh, the estimate estimates a multiple of this uh, column of the 
a B matrix that we are interested in. And uh, we can now get this B that we are really interested in by just saying what the size of our shock should be. We maybe we standardize it in such some way like for a monetary policy shock very often people look at 25 basis points size shocks or so and we standardize one element in this vector estimated vector and thereby we cancel out the c and then we have exactly the vector of impact effects of our first shock that we are interested in so that looks great and that is really so uh, the beauty of this that it's everything is so simple the computations are very simple and you know it's easy to understand what we are doing and you know we get good estimates of of the impact effects of our shock everything is beautiful except that if you have heteroscedasticity well then you see already there may be a problem here if you have the covariance of a quantity a vector that has heteroscedasticity with one that may be maybe doesn't have heteroscedasticity, then the covariance can change at the point where the volatility changes, right? And that would, of course, then mean that either the C or the B or both change. So if the B changes, then you have a change in the transmission of your shock, not only on impact, but these impact effects also determine the impulse responses with higher horizon, uh, propagation horizons and therefore have an impact also at higher, higher horizons. And basically, the whole transmission mechanism is uh, affected by that. So, that is something one would like to test for. At least that's what we thought. And I had a paper uh, last year in the JBS with Tore Schlag where we developed a test for this situation. But exactly for this situation where you have one proxy to identify one shock in the system. But nowadays, people get more ambitious. They don't want just one shock to be identified by a proxy, but a set of shocks to be identified by a proxy. So Lansford in his study, he looked at two TFP shocks, the consumption TFP shock and in, an investment TFP shock. So we needed two proxies and wanted to identify these two shocks by proxies. Then the situation changes a little bit. And let me show you um, how we can look at that and how, how we can you know, do the identification now. Uh, again, we have our vector of structural shocks here, but now we split it up in two parts. The first part is the part of interest in a sense for which we have proxies. So in the example case, there would be two elements in this bold phase W1T and the remainder, all the other shocks are in the second part of this uh, vector in the W2T. And the matrix of impact effects, the B matrix is now split up into sub matrices. The first one is B1 refers to the shocks of interest that we, that we want to identify by proxies and the others are, you know, maybe not so interesting or are identified in some other way. And now, uh, if you look at the conditions for the proxies, by the way, I, you know, in this literature, you, you don't take just two proxies to identify two shocks potentially, but you take more proxies potentially to identify two shocks. That's not a problem. Formally, you can write down all these things easily, but in practice, sometimes, People also still use two proxies for two shocks. Anyway, um, here I have now the first condition for our proxies that they have to be correlated with the proxies, the vector of proxies now, the ZT prime times the vector of shocks to be identified here. And um, that is a matrix, the covariance matrix between the first the shocks of interest and the proxies, right? It's a matrix. It should have rank K1, otherwise we would be in trouble. We wouldn't really identify all the shocks that uh, we are after. And that is called, again, the relevant, or this is the relevance condition. It's more general case, I should say. And the exogeneity condition here is that, of course, the proxies are not correlated with the remaining shocks. Now, if I do the same 
kind of uh, uh, relation, determine the relation between the reduced form errors and the proxies, what I get is not the impact effects of the shocks of interest, but I get this B1 matrix times another matrix C. So I, you know, in this case, the shocks are not identified individually. So we have to bring in further information to identify our shocks of interest individually. At this point, if we want to, you know, identify them individually. And that is usually necessary to do impulse response analysis and so forth. So how do people do it? Well, they use this classical or conventional methods to identify shocks in the structure VAR context. They use sign restrictions or maybe just uh, zero restrictions on the impact effects or on the long run effects or something like that. And that is sometimes, you know, an additional step that is a little more controversial and sometimes, um, you know, it's not so easy to swallow those conditions, which was, of course, the reason to bring in this idea with identification through proxies that uh, uh, has been become quite successful in the last years. Um, so therefore, we want to develop a test now that uh, we can use without imposing further identifying restrictions for the individual shocks. That makes the uh, thing a little more difficult and we cannot simply use this test uh, from the other paper that I mentioned. So um, that's, that refers now to the second part of the title, the uh, construction of a identification robust test for time bearing um, transmission of our shocks. So how can we do that? And there's, by the way, there's another reason why it's good to do it to test for time varying the transmission of the shocks at this point rather than only after we have identified the shocks because sometimes you may even want to use heteroscedasticity for identifying the shocks individually if you want to do that you may recall that that requires that the shocks only change variants but do not change their impact on the system so the impact effects have to be time invariant. So that's also at this point where it's important that we don't have to do the identification first, but first know whether we can use this tool for identification and check whether we can use this tool for identification. And therefore it's good to have a test that is identification robust, that doesn't need to identify the shocks individually. Sorry. Uh, uh... Uh, Olmut, so uh, in terms, so in, in the presence of, of many proxies, mm -hmm. so how, how, how we should proceed? Should we like consider uh, a combination of these proxies or if we take proxies individually, how, 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 this, how this can help in terms of like identification, like, you know, making sure that we have the right B or uh, yeah. or maybe that how, how sensitive B to the, to the proxies and well, it just means you have a bigger covariance matrix here that involves the impact effects. And you have to come up with, if you have many uh, proxies, say N is a number much larger than K1, then this would be uh, a, K1, a K by N matrix. And that somehow involves this smaller matrix, K by K1 matrix, B1, and we have to dig it out somehow. We have to impose restrictions on this covariance matrix to identify the shocks from this covariance matrix somehow. That could be if you have sometimes, you know, if you have say two proxies for two shocks, you can assume something like, you know, you have a lower triangular pattern there or something like that. And you impose zero restrictions on some of these uh, elements and then you get identification and you can dig out the 
Because what, what, what I have in mind is like is like similar to the instruments, right? I mean, uh, so which instrument we should pick and which, I mean, how, I mean, the effect of weak instruments uh, on the estimation. So I guess the same questions may be, uh, I mean, can be asked in this context too. Yes, yes, I mean, I, and people have come up with even using sign restrictions at this point mm -hmm. to identify the shocks then individually. But, you know, sometimes people also try to identify still each shock by one specific proxy. They construct one proxy for mm -hmm. the first shock, one for the second one, and then uh, assume that these proxies are not related to the other shocks. Okay. Right, uh, each of them not related to the remaining shocks. If you have a good proxy that does uh, that satisfies that property, then fine. But that is not so common. Uh, very often, when you have the situation that people identify these uh, uh, set of shocks by a set of proxies, then you have uh, that the proxies are not even uncorrelated potentially. And uh, that, of course, means then you would also have some kind of uh, dependence between the shock for, uh, say, the f uh, sorry, the proxy for the first shock and the uh, proxy for the, uh, it's also correlated perhaps with the second shock and vice versa, right? So therefore, um, you have often the situation that this is, you know, not sufficient when you have more shocks than, and more uh, proxies than shocks, then you have to come up with further restrictions here. And identifying restrictions, I, well, we see an example at the end where uh, I talk a little bit about it, but maybe we go on now and, and, you know, people are using all kinds of conventional tools for identifying shocks at this point, in addition to the proxies. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So now let's go on and try to get this uh, to get this test. And for that, I introduce, of course, now a heteroscedastic model. Or uh, by the way, I maybe I should say again. I mean, here, of course, we have the same trouble. If there is heteroscedasticity in the shocks, and then also, of course, in the reduced form errors, then of course, if it's well possible that this C this covariance between the shocks and proxies changes. And also, uh, you know, this relation may change the relation between the reuse form errors and the proxies. So meaning that the B1 matrix may also change. And that's what we are, what we want to test, right? So the heteroscedastic model that we are considering here is a very simple one. The reduced form looks exactly the same as before. Now the reduced form errors are heteroscedastic. We allow them to have time varying covariances. And we assume there are M regimes, volatility regimes. And uh, we can um, assign every time point in our sample to one of these volatility regimes. Right, so we have m different volatility regimes. It's a fairly simple model. Think of you have two volatility regimes, as in the example. The first half is a high volatility regime, the second half a low volatility regime, something like that. And you have maybe more than two, but um, you may also have exactly the situation from the example, perhaps. And then, of course, the we allow now that the impact effects are somehow dependent on the volatility regime. They may change across volatility regimes. So we give them a subscript little m referring to the volatility regime. And uh, now, of course, then our structural form of the model looks like this. It is a different transformation matrix here to go from the reduced form to the structural form errors and for each volatility regime. And also, of course, the covariance between the shocks of interest and the proxy may change with the volatility regime. 
the C also gets a subscript M. And overall, the covariance between the reduced form errors and the shocks is now also dependent on the volatility regime. The trouble is this thing we can easily estimate. This DM, this is the covariance between the reduced form errors and the proxies, we can easily estimate, surely. From each volatility regime, we can estimate this uh, D matrix. But this is a product here, this product. And we are interested only in the first part of the product. So how can we get rid of this CM here when we do our test for time varying impact effects? That's the problem that we are facing. And here's the solution. Here comes the solution. So we want to test that the impact effects in the Mth regime and the impact effects in the Kth regime are the same. That's our null hypothesis. We want to test that against the alternative hypothesis that they are distinct, right? And um, we know we can only estimate this D matrix, this uh, covariance between the reduced form errors and the proxies well. So we can, I've written down the estimator here. It's no problem to estimate that. But we are still, we don't have an estimator of the B1 matrices then for the different volatility regimes. And, and now what we do. Hi, Alan. Could I yes. interrupt just a clarification here? One thing I, I, I was not sure to understand is your null, is it for all the pairs in this set that you're testing or only for only some of them? Because the examples no. you gave, mm -hmm. we're only looking at one pair. Yeah, in the example, there was just one pair. No, what we are doing is we are constructing a test for one pair, basically. For, uh, but it could be applied to each pair, of course, separately then. But we are looking only at a test for one pair. We, in the example, it was uh, M, let's say M is one and K is two. We want to test that we have the same impact effects in the first volatility regime as in the second volatility regime. But, but could you in, aggregate this? Could you generalize it to, uh, to looking at all the possible pairs? Uh, we haven't really considered this joint testing thing. Now we have only focused on testing for two different volatility regimes, whether the impact effects are the same. So that's, that's the test that we are proposing. Of course, you could uh, set up a bigger test and test them all somehow, but, uh, or you could do a joint testing procedure and then you would have to adjust the uh, level of the test and, and uh, so forth. I mean, that we didn't go into in the paper, at least not so far. Okay, now here comes the, the way we get rid of this identification problem uh, in this test. We split up our B1 matrix in the first part, which is K1 by K1. So the number of shocks of interest, uh, square matrix of the number of shocks of interest and the remaining uh, part. And we split up the D matrix in a similar way. First K1 rows and second K minus K1 rows. And then it turns out, then we transform our, sorry, we transform our matrix of impact effects of interest, this B1 matrix, or the elements in this way. You look at this quantity, at this matrix, and it turns out to be a matrix that can be represented purely in terms of these submatrices of the D matrix. The D matrix, remember, we can estimate well, and that means we can also estimate this thing well, this uh, second last line here, we can estimate that well in the sense that we can set up a consistent estimator and can also work out asymptotic normality under standard assumptions and so forth, right? So and that means, of course, we can estimate this thing well. So therefore, we are changing our test a little bit and we are testing that for the Mth regime, this matrix, this trans matrix of transformed impact effects is equal to the matrix of transformed impact effects in the case volatility regime. 
against the alternative that they are not equal, of course. And then we construct a standard chi-square test in the usual way, I might say, in a, take it wall type test. I, the best statistic is here, you vectorize this matrix of transformed impact effects and look at the estimated uh, vectorized matrices for the mth regime, the case regime, take the difference, divide by the covariance and the difference. Again, that's the world type setup. And then you get a, an asymptotic chi-square distribution. But now, if you look at the degrees of freedom here, we have here k1 times k minus k1 degrees of freedom. So apparently we are testing, given that this is a standard uh, testing setup, we are testing k times k minus k1 restrictions here. And if you look back at the original testing problem, we wanted to test this matrix against that matrix. And this B1 matrix is a k by k1 matrix. That's more elements than we have restrictions here. So we originally, we wanted to test more restrictions, but in the end, we come out with testing only fewer restrictions. And that's the price we have to pay for canceling out the identification problem in a way that we are, basically, we don't get power against some points in the space of alternatives. So the test has not power in all directions under the alternative. That's the, the sad um, thing about this test, but in any case, it's better than having no test at all, I think. And also, um, you know, it happens for other reasons, usually that you cannot reject a null hypothesis even if it's wrong. So that can happen here as well. But here it can happen because you have too few data, too, few, too little data information. It can happen because you have um, you are sorry. in a situation where you are testing in the wrong direction of the, the alternative. Albert, but can I, you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Hi, Albert. Sorry. Hi, Luca. Hi. Great to see you. Uh, just a clarification. So if I understand correctly, imagine that you have a change in the C parameter. So you have a change in the say relevance of the proxies across volatility regimes, but not a change in the B1 coefficient. So in, mm -hmm. not in the on impact coefficient. If I understand correctly, your test is going to incorrectly reject in the null. Is that correct? So you don't have sites control in no, that no. specific case. In that case, the null hypothesis is satisfied. The B1s are not changing. If I understood you correctly. Yeah, B1 not changing, but C are changing. C changing. In that case, the test, the null hypothesis is correct and the test has, should be okay. It should have the, the, uh, the level that you, are, you specify. It's a 5% test. You should reject in 5% of the cases, right? Okay. So it cancels out this, uh, time varying bit that comes through the C. That's the crucial idea here. But I should also mention that even if you want to test uh, these two matrices and you think you have K times K1 restrictions to test here, that is not quite true because once you have identified, it's usually not quite true, I should perhaps say, once you have identified the elements in these B1 matrices, you, you have imposed further restrictions and thereby you also reduce the parameter space. But that's not necessary. You don't have to think about these restrictions here. It's the good thing is you get it for free in a way by canceling out um, this identification thing and you get uh, this test statistic, which is asymptotically chi-square with reduced number of degrees of freedom, but uh, uh, anyway, there is potentially a bit of power against some alternatives, at least some relevant alternatives. Okay, now um, let's have a look at the small sample properties of this test. Uh, we have this, uh, we are guessing that our test may, uh, that small sample 
properties may depend on the sample size, the leg order of our model, the proxy strengths. That's how strongly related the proxies are to the shocks of interest that they are supposed to identify. Um, the number of variables in the system that determines the size of the model and therefore could be relevant for the properties in small samples of this test. And uh, the number of proxies and shocks. So you may have more proxies to identify more shocks, then that could make a difference. And uh, of course, the distance from the um, parameter space under the null hypothesis is uh, crucial. Uh, and also something I haven't really talked about, I have assumed that we know somehow the volatility regimes. That is not normally the case in practice where you, well, in this uh, great moderation thing, you can perhaps, uh, yeah, you can perhaps think that you know roughly at least where the change in volatility occurred, but in many other situations, you may not know that and you may want to specify somehow the volatility change points by some statistical procedure or so, and that then uh, in induces somehow perhaps uh, pre-testing issues and so forth. And we would wanted to see how uh, that has an impact on the small sample properties of our tests. And here's the first DGP. That is a DGP that we used already in this other paper that I did with Toro Schlag. And um, there we had three variables and three volatility regimes two proxies to identify two shocks. Well, two sh that's uh, different here. We were only interested in identifying one shock in this paper, but um, this is how we do it here now. And then we have uh, under the alternative we use parameters in the first regime, these beta parameters, the vectorized transformed uh, impact effects, um, which are zero and zero. And in the second regime, the corresponding matrix is very different from those in the first regime. But in the third regime, that's very close, pretty close, let's say pretty close to what we have in the first regime. So we should have quite different power testing these different hypotheses. And that's um, why I show you that um, this is uh, set up in this way. And now here are some results. Under the null hypothesis, rejection frequencies under the null hypothesis, and you see quite a few uh, things here. First of all, um, these are all rejection frequencies. The first row is uh, for leg order one. That's the true leg order in this case of the process, but we also fitted models of leg order 12. That's what you see in the second row. So you see already that doesn't change much. You know, there's a little bit of change in the rejection frequencies, but not very much. Here in the specific blocks here in these uh, little panels, you have changing sample size from left to right, it gets bigger. And there you see already here, uh, the sample size, the, the level of the test gets closer, the empirical rejection frequencies get closer to 5%, which was a uh, empiric, uh, uh, assigned uh, significance level that we were using here. And uh, that happens everywhere. So asymptotic, the asymptotics works. That's uh, not the problem because we start with a sample size 150. So 50 observations for each of the volatility regimes. And then second one is 300 observations. Then we have 600 observations and we have 1,200 observations for the rightmost block here, rightmost uh, uh, bar in this package. And that's the same everywhere here. And here on the uh, horizontal line, we are changing the strength of the proxies. This kappa stand, stands for a certain strength of the proxies. Here, the proxies are pretty strong. In the middle, they are medium. And in, on the right-hand side, they are not so strong anymore. They're not really weak proxies yet, but they are uh, pretty weaker proxies, let's say. And that happens everywhere here. Here, uh, These are the three hypotheses that uh, we are testing. When we have three volatility regimes, we can test um, the first one against the second, the first one against the third, and the second one against the third. <clears throat> 
So under the null hypothesis, that shouldn't be a big difference. So that's what we see here also. The good news here is that all these rejection frequencies are really pretty close to 5%, right? This black line is 5%, and uh, this largest thing here is not even 8%. So they are pretty close, even for the smallest sample size, which is really pretty small for uh, the kind of situation we are looking at. We want to make uh, tests of, on the second moments in a way. And uh, you know, therefore, you have to expect that you need already quite a few observations to get good uh, results, good small sample results. Now let's have a look at the power. Well, there you see larger sample sizes, of course, increase the power. That's very clear in all the packages from left to right, the power get, ri rises. But you see also here is in the middle, you have also the situation where you have very little power. And that's exactly where you test the first against the third regime where the parameters are not so different. Right, and the test, uh, the test responds to that by having less power as one would expect. Another feature that you see here is there is a downturn from left to right in these little packages of uh, bars. And that means for uh, stronger proxies, you have more power than for weaker proxies. So that determines also a little bit of uh, the power. And here, now you see also in the second row where we have the uh, larger leg order that also having larger models, larger leg orders reduces the power. Again, these bars are where they are not one, they are smaller than the ones in the upper packages here, right? So that's one of the uh, results. We have uh, quite a few of the, simulations in the paper, I want to show uh, you a few others that uh, before I um, go to the example. Uh, the summary of the results we got from this first uh, DGP are that increasing sample size um, improves the uh, uh, precision of the level and gives you better power. Larger distance from the null hypothesis, uh, more power, clearly that's not uh, a surprise. Large leg order reduces the power, and weaker proxies also reduce the power in small samples. And this one we haven't, I haven't discussed, so let me just jump over that. And let's have a look at the second DGP quickly, because there- uh, Elmut, sorry, sorry. Yes. Just, just a clarification, just to understand. So when you, so your weak proxy case is not, you're not considering say local to zero proxy. You, you just no, 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 no. taking small correlation. Okay. So right. it does not, I mean, the, the, the strength of the proxy does not declines with the increase of the sample size. If right, you right. I mean, okay. yes, it says weaker proxy and not weak proxy. So okay. that's a okay. distinction, okay. but I agree, Understand. I mean, this, this is perhaps the, the most uh, intuitive wording. Thank I you. agree fully Thank because that's, uh, yeah, weak proxy is a term that is used in this literature and people have different um, inference uh, procedures for that, of course. Um, now the second DGP has five variables and we have constructed it after the DGP of uh, the Lansford paper so that we see what, you know, we use that also as an example later on. And uh, we wanted to this, uh, somehow know the properties uh, under simulation uh, designs. And um, we also uh, then uh, choose the, uh, the break point or the change point of the volatility by some statistical criterion. And we are using may, well, broadly speaking, a Gaussian likelihood uh, criterion for the case where you have two different uh, covariance matrices. And everything else remaining the same, right? That, that you would get here and that's what you um, minimize in this case. We have set it up such a way that you uh, minimize this thing and 
then you uh, get a break point where it's most likely due to this criterion. I, I show you some results of that in, in a minute. And what we wanted to investigate here is the leg order, the proxy strengths increasing the number of identified shocks. Here we have more variables, so we can also have more identified shocks. And um, also what happens when we misspecify the volatility change point and what happens when we search for the volatility breakpoint. So here again, you see the uh, level of the test, the rejection frequencies under the null hypothesis. And what we are comparing here is the situation in the first row where the, uh, break, the true breakpoint is used. It's happening in the middle of the sample. And in the ro second row, you see what you get for the rejection frequencies if you misspecify the breakpoint and think it's already or set it at 40% of the sample size already. So in a, for the 300 uh, sample size of 300 observations, you would set it at 120 rather than 150, so a gross misspecification of the volatility uh, regimes. And you see these pictures almost look the same. Doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter whether you misspecify the volatility breakpoint, even if you uh, you know you misspecified grossly in a way, right? And for the power now, the thing is a little bit. Um, it's almost uh, surprising. Was almost surprising to us. Again, the same picture. I mean, this misspecification of the breakpoint doesn't matter much here. Right, you get almost the same pictures. So it doesn't, you know, the test, what the test needs is only a clearly different volatility in the first regime and in the second regime. Uh, whether it's the true one or not, whether you have estimated it well or not, doesn't really matter so much, surprisingly. And now here is this, uh, the case where we choose the volatility change point by the statistical criterion. And again, you have almost the same pictures in the first row and in the second row. The first row, again, the, the true volatility change point is used in the second row. The statistical criterion is used to specify the volatility change point. So that's a little bit, uh, that's interesting. By the way, here we have also now looked at the case where we have two shocks to identify, three shocks of interest or four shocks of interest. And that makes a little bit of a difference. Having more shocks to identify reduces the power a little bit. That's what you see here, right? But- um, I was wondering, could yes? I ask you a question here on the, on the importance of the, the misspecification? So mm -hmm. what if you had more breaks? Like you, you're thinking that you're searching only for a break point, but what if you had, you know, three breaks and you're collapsing all the observations in the second regime in the last two regimes into one? Yeah, um, that is a good question. And uh, we have not explored that particular case for this setup, but for the case of this previous test where we, test only the situation where you have one proxy and one shock. For that, we have uh, done some more experimentation in that uh, respect also. And we found, in fact, that even if the volatility model is a totally different one, it's not even this a few different regimes, but if you apply the test to a regime which is, has a different volatility from empirically, from the other regime, then uh, you, the test works well. I mean, that was a little bit of a surprise uh, to some extent to us. I mean, it, you can stretch it, of course, in a way that you make this statement collapse, but for these, uh, you know, kind of things we had in mind, uh, it worked uh, pretty well. And I, I guess a related question, which I is if you could allow, if you have only had a problem of conditional heteroscedasticity, then none of these would work, right? It, well, again, you didn't have uh, these deterministic uh, shifts in the, in the second one, 
Well, I think we haven't really tried that, but given these experiments that we did with the more a simpler case for the simpler case, there you just need volatility clusters that you get or very often in for these uh, arch and gauge processes. And uh, you could use those to do these tests. And probably you, they would have uh, decent small sample properties that, that I would guess on the basis of the experiments we have done. But true, we haven't really tried that and I shouldn't uh, stretch it too much, yeah. But we have tried quite a few things for the simpler case and uh, they are, uh, it was surprisingly robust, uh, these results, right? Okay, uh, so this is already what I said before. So I jump over the summary of these uh, simulation results here. Uh, the important thing is if you have more, larger models reduce power, smaller samples reduce power and weaker proxies also reduce power. So that's important to keep in mind for the empirical example that I briefly want to discuss. And that's exactly the example from Lansford again, with two uh, proxies for two shocks, TFP shocks, one consumption TFP shock, one um, investment TFP shock. And um, yeah, I mean, here the picture of the residuals again, uh, to show you there is heteroscedasticity and it's, uh, clearly linked to the great moderation in this case, it's pretty simple. And we put the great moderation at fourth quarter of 1983. That is not uh, you know, unanimous in the literature. People discuss various possibilities where it may have started, but our statistical criterion tells us to put it there. And now if you look at the test results for that quarter and the quarters around there, that for that quarter particularly we get around 5% uh, p-value, which means for, uh, well, for 5% test we wouldn't reject, but for the next quarter we would reject even, 5% uh, test would even reject. And give all uh, these results are obtained in a situation where we have a low power environment, right? In the sense that we have a fairly large model, five variables, four legs, we have I haven't uh, shown you these results, but the proxies are not that strong. So they are on the uh, weaker side. And also the sample size is pretty small. It's not even 300, right? So even then we get these p-values so that we interpret as fairly substantial evidence against time invariant shock transmission. And um, Therefore, it makes, of course, uh, one wonders, of course, how much difference does it make? And uh, so we have also computed impulse responses and here they are. And um, the blue areas are the confidence intervals around the shocks we get for the pre-grade moderation period and the red ones are for the post-grade moderation period. And there you see that there are some quite substantial differences. If you look at, for instance, this one, inflation, the impact on inflation, I mean, whether you have no response of inflation like after the great moderation, or you have a substantial impact on great moderation when a consumption TFP shock hits, that makes a difference for monetary policy, for instance, right? So it's really something to take into account if you have this uh, heteroscedasticity and it's really can be valuable to check whether the impact effects and then also, of course, all the transmission of the shocks uh, may change uh, due to this heteroscedasticity or change in volatility in your shocks. Here, I have to tell you a little bit more maybe about how we did these uh, graphs. We did it as um, Lansford did it roughly. We used, uh, first of all, um, moving block bootstrap. And a moving block bootstrap is uh, a little problematic because it 
requires a lot of observations, long, uh, big samples to work well. And otherwise it gives you very wide confidence bands. And even though we have used that, we get these uh, quite, uh, these are 90% confidence intervals. Um, so even then we get non-overlapping intervals here, which indicates to us there has been some change in the uh, transmission mechanism. Also, we had to identify now, of course, the shocks individually to do this impulse response analysis. So how did we do it? Well, we did it as Lansford did it. He assumes that his shocks, uh, his proxies are identifying one shock each. And he finds that the correlation to the other shock is low or to the other proxy is low. And then he uh, thinks that maybe a valid or a, uh, possibility to do the identification. That's how we did it also. And even then, I mean, this black line is roughly what he got is similar to what he got when you do the impulse responses for the whole uh, sample period, not assuming that there could be a change in the impact effects at some point when the great moderation occurred. So yeah, that's... Uh, about it. In conclusion, um, we have proposed a test for time varying impact effects when the shocks are heteroscedastic and when there are multiple proxies that do not identify the associated shocks individually. And uh, then you don't uh, have to identify them individually. The test is identification robust, so therefore you can apply it in that situation. In, uh, we have investigated the small sample properties and uh, you can read quite a few of the results in the paper also. And there's an application uh, in the paper as I've just shown you, or application, I should say an example model. Uh, it's meant to be an example. Otherwise I would have to discuss perhaps also the economics in the background a little more. And our recommendation based on our investigation would be to use these tests routinely when you have heteroscedasticity. And of course, that also means don't use just heteroscedasticity robust methods for proxy VAR analysis if you haven't checked that the change in volatility of your shocks doesn't imply also a change in the transmission mechanism of the shocks. So that's it. Thanks for your interest. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording and then we can move to the informal chat. Okay. <laughs>